for this morning. I'm going to be here in Matthew chapter 21, and I'm only going to read two verses. This is a familiar passage probably to many of you. Uh, This is one of these rare moments where Jesus shows us a side of him that we don't often see, but it's found here in Matthew 21, verses 12 to 13, only those two verses. Verse 12, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I've entitled my teaching today, Understanding God's Anger. Understanding God's Anger. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy for this day. And even though we are not able to meet in person, we thank you through the wonder of technology that we're able to connect homes across the world to have this Bible study together today. So we just pray now that you would be glorified as we study this passage together. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on a cross for our sins. Be glorified now as we study together in Jesus' name. And everybody home said, amen and amen. You'll notice in your Bibles with me that as we head into Matthew chapter 21, uh, it pivots in terms of the, the time of, of events because the first 20 chapters of the book of Matthew cover about three years. But now when we get to chapter 21, it slows way down. And the last few chapters, chapters 21 to the end of the book to chapter 28, uh, cover only one week. So first 20 chapters, Uh, three years. Uh, The last eight chapters here cover only one week. So time slows way down. And chapter 21 here begins the final week of Jesus's life. This chapter opens up with a reference here to Jesus coming into Jerusalem on what we traditionally call Palm Sunday. He's riding on a donkey. He's being hailed as the Messiah by a large crowd of people that are cheering along the roadside and waving palm branches. And the first thing that it tells us here in chapter 21 that Jesus does when he comes into the city is to go to the temple. And there in the courtyard of the temple is this glorified flea market. That's, that's the way it really is and was in that day. Uh, Josephus, the first century Jewish Roman historian, called it the Bazaar of Annas. Now, Annas was the Jewish high priest at this particular time in Jewish history. And Annas set up shops uh, in the courtyard of the temple as a way to make a boatload of cash for himself. And here's how he would do it. When people would gather there, and on this particular occasion, this is the Feast of Passover followed by unleavened bread. And so people would come to Jerusalem in, in, by the thousands. And uh, when worshipers would come there to God's house, everyone aged 20 and older was required by the law, this is Exodus chapter 30, they were required to pay a half a shekel. So if you were 20 years old or older, you were required to pay a half a shekel as basically a temple offering, and this would help to, uh, for the upkeep and maintenance of the temple, and it would also help in some ways to support the priests. But in Jesus' day, the common currency was Roman, Roman coins. And so when the Jews would come to the temple, they could not use Roman coins. It was not acceptable to pay with Roman coins. They usually had a picture of uh, one of the Caesars, and so it was considered pagan uh, on, on the face of their coins. And so they couldn't use the Roman coin to pay the temple offering. And so what they would have to do is they would have to exchange Roman coins for a temple shekel. And when they would get there, one of the things that Annas would do is he would charge them this exorbitant exchange rate to exchange their Roman coins for the temple shekel. 
And some commentary said that Annas would charge as much as 25% for the exchange rate. So you'd get to Jerusalem and all you would have is Roman coins. That was the common currency. And so you'd get there to pay the half a shekel and you wouldn't have any money. So there would be these money changers and they'd be on the, at, in, in the temple court area and they would be like, you don't have any shekel? I can take care of you. Come my way. And then they would charge you 25% to change the money. So that was one way that Annas would line his pocket. And then the other way was through the animal fees. Because as the worshipers would come to Jerusalem, you had to bring an animal. Here's Passover. You had to bring a lamb uh, for the sacrifice on behalf of your family. One lamb was good for 10 people in a household. Well, the problem is people are coming from all over. And you're not going to want to haul lamb chops from wherever you're coming from because that's, uh, you know, that's, that's taxing that, to haul your animal all the way from wherever you're coming from. And so what they would do is they would show up at the temple, and if you, don't, if you didn't bring a lamb because it was, it was too difficult, then you would pay for a lamb there. You know, these lambs for the Passover, the Bible says, had to be lambs without spot or blemish. They couldn't have any defects in these lambs. Otherwise, it was not an acceptable sacrifice. And that's another reason why people didn't want to haul their lamb all the way from their homes to the temple, because along the way, as people would camp out overnight, if it's a several day journey to get Jerusalem, you know, wolves would come in the middle of the night, maybe chew off a lamb chop, you know, and so you can't present your lamb with three legs now, it's unacceptable. And you don't have time to go back home, because by the time you get back home and get back to Jerusalem, Passover is going to be over. So you you wouldn't typically bring a lamb. You would buy one when you got there. And again, they would charge this exorbitant rate. Some Bible commentary said as much as 10 times the actual cost is what you would pay for a lamb at the temple court. 10 times. It's kind of like the deal. You know how you can go to McDonald's and get like two cheeseburgers on the dollar menu, two cheeseburgers for a dollar. But when you go to a sporting event, like at a stadium, It's like 20 bucks for the same cheeseburger. Oh, you want a Coke with that? It's going to be another 20 bucks. So that's the idea. Once you're there, you know, they hold you hostage and you have to pay for it. So people would come from all over. They wouldn't bring their lambs typically. You'd buy one there and they would be charging you sometimes 10 times the price of a lamb normally on the market. Now, if you happen to live close enough to Jerusalem, maybe you lived in Jerusalem itself when feast time came, and you were able to bring your own lamb, here's another way that they would gouge you. You brought your lamb for the sacrifice. You don't, you don't need to buy one of their ones that's charged 10 times more. You would have to pay an inspection fee. They would have priests there to make sure that your lamb didn't have any defect, any injury, any sickness, anything wrong with it. So you're paying an inspection fee even if you bring your own lamb. And if they happen to find something, and you might dispute with them, but if they find something that they think, oh, this means it's no good, then you got to buy another lamb while you're there. I, I, I remember several years ago having my car inspected here in town. I won't tell you where it was, but I don't go there anymore. And it was one of those deals where they're like, oh, your headlight is a little bit off. We're going to have to charge you more to adjust the headlight. Well, if I wanted to pass inspection, they had me hostage there. I had to say, okay. So I get charged an extra fee. To this day, I don't know if my headlight was really off or not. But it's the kind of thing where you're like, well, I'm there. So I guess I got I to cough up the money if I, if I want to pass. And so this is how they would get you, coming and going in the temple area. If it wasn't through the exchange rate of the temple shekel from the Roman coins, then it was the price you would pay to buy a lamb there or the inspection price if you brought your own lamb. They would get you coming and they would get you going. And some Bible scholars believe that in today's dollars, Annas the high priest, by setting up these shops and charging these exorbitant rates and gouging the people, that in today's dollars, Annas would rake in anywhere from around three to five million dollars every year in today's currency. And so it was a racket. And Annas not only had turned the sacred into the secular for personal profit, but he had ripped people off in the process. So no wonder Jesus is angry here. And he goes in there, 
and he sees all this happening, and Jesus starts overturning the tables of the money changers, and he quotes from Isaiah 56, verse 7, my house should be called a house of prayer, and then he quotes from Jeremiah 7, verse 11, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so understandably here, Jesus is mad because of what's going on here. I wanted you to know the background so you could understand. Why, why is Jesus so ticked off? He comes into the temple because Annas is lining his pockets at the expense of the people. He's not helping them to get closer to God. He's an obstacle from them getting to God. He's doing it all for financial gain, and it's all a racket. And so Jesus was mad here because the temple had become a place of profit instead of a place of prayer. It had become a place of the secular instead of a place of the sacred. It was a place where people were being taken advantage of instead of being helped to find God. So Jesus was angry here. In fact, in John's account, in John chapter 2, when he tells the story, he says that Jesus fashioned a whip and went around driving out the money changers and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, taking the whip to, to things and to people. And so, you know, not the typical Jesus that we teach in Sunday school classes, but nevertheless, a Jesus who was entitled to be angry. A lot of people refer to this as righteous indignation, and that's, that's really what it was. And we need to understand that not all anger is sin. Uh, it isn't here. This isn't sin when Jesus gets angry like this. This is righteous indignation that Jesus has about how they have profaned the house of God and how they have fleeced the people of God. And so Jesus got angry. And I think it's important for us to recognize that there are some things that make God angry. Now, I don't think we need to dwell on it because I don't think the Bible emphasizes it more than it does His mercy. But I do think that we should understand this aspect of His nature because without that understanding, we are liable to treat God with disrespect and disobedience because we only see him as a lovable teddy bear. When, in fact, there is this other part of God that is like a grizzly bear that you don't want to mess with. I have a pastor friend in Georgia who, who put it like this. He, he once said to me, Gary, God has a heart like a teddy bear, but he has a will like a grizzly bear. And when you dance with a grizzly bear, you learn to let him lead. Well, that's Southern, but I get what he's saying there. You know, if God is really in charge, his will is like a grizzly bear. And when we defy him, disobey him, when we disrespect him, we are liable to encounter another side of God that isn't often talked about. So I'm going to talk about this morning uh, what makes God angry. And I'm going to give you the bad news first, but hold on because I'm going to get to the good news. There is a good part of understanding the anger of God, so stay tuned. But first, the bad news. I'm going to share five things with you about what makes God angry. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. You could do a Bible study for a long period of time and find out a variety of things that makes God angry. But I'm going to take you to five particular things that stood out to me from Scripture. And what's interesting is did you know that the first time that we see God angry in the Bible, first time that it is recorded, it's not when Adam and Eve sinned against him. It's not when Cain killed Abel. It's not when people built the Tower of Babel. It's not even when people were engaging in sexual sin at Sodom and Gomorrah, though all those things were sins against God that no doubt grieved him. But the first time recorded in the Bible that God got angry was in a conversation that he had with Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 4. Now, most of you know the background, but here it is in case you don't know. God called Moses to be a deliverer to lead the Hebrew slaves out of slavery in Egypt and to the promised land. And Moses was raised up by God to be the deliverer for the Hebrew people. And so God appears to Moses and speaks to Moses in this burning bush and basically calls him to take on this responsibility as being a deliverer. But Moses gave God every excuse in the book as to why he didn't want to do what God had called him to do. And when you read the account in the early chapters of Exodus, 
Moses comes up with things like, well, um, what should I tell them is your name when they ask who is sending me? Um, he says to them, I, I don't speak very well. He had a stuttering problem or a speech impediment of some kind until finally he says to God, why don't you just ask somebody else? Just ask somebody else, God. You have the wrong person. And in response to that, it tells us in Exodus 4, verse 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses because Moses kept making excuses as to why he shouldn't accept the calling that God had placed upon his life. Now, you know, fortunately for Moses, God didn't kill him. God didn't kill Moses. It all worked out. But make note of that. The first time that we see God angry in the Bible is when someone was reluctant to do what God called him to do. If you're taking notes, it's point number one. When does God get angry? When people refuse to do what God has called them to do. I ask you, is there anything that God is calling you to do that you are not doing? Because if that's the case, then is God angry about it? Sometimes we forget that disobedience to God is not always about the things that we do. Sometimes disobedience to God is about the things we refuse to do that God is telling us to do. James in his epistle would say this in James 4, 17. He said, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's James 4, 17. That's what we call sins of omission. When we, when we don't do something that we should do, it can make God angry when he's called us to do something and we refuse to do it. But then, of course, there's the sins of commission. This is probably where we're guiltier than the sins of omission. I think, at least in my life, there's things that I do that are probably more offensive to God than things I don't do. But there are some things that, that are sins of commission that we do that make God angry. Uh, here's one. Again, this is just a short list, but you're going to love this one. Number two on the list is when people complain. Did you know that makes God angry when people complain? In the Old Testament, when God delivered the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, and he brought them to the promised land, along the way they had this journey through the Sinai as they were going from Egypt to the promised land, and God provided for them, and he cared for them, and nevertheless, all along the way, the people complained. They complained about their conditions. They complained about the food. They complained about the leadership of Moses. They complained when they realized there wasn't anything to complain about. I was on the phone this week. Uh, many of you might remember when the Israeli ambassador, Ron Dermer, came here and spoke uh, at Cornerstone uh, back in 2019. Well, his chief of staff called me this week and had told me that the ambassador had finished his term and so he had stepped down a few days ago. And, and then I asked, uh, I asked the chief of staff, I said, do you think he'll run for prime minister? And in his Jewish accent, he said, uh, his, his uh, Hebrew accent, he said, uh, well, Pastor Gary, uh, you should know. I don't know if he will run for prime minister or not, but the Jewish people are hard people to lead. And I said to him, yeah, I think Moses would agree with you. Moshe in the Old Testament, he would understand leading the people because they complained time after time after time about everything. And in Numbers 11, verse 1, this is what we read. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. Can I just suggest to all of us to be grateful for all that we have and all that God has done for us, that God hears our ungratefulness, he hears our complaining, in fact, Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In other words, Paul is drawing the contrast there in Philippians 2. He's like, the rest of the world, they're a bunch of complainers. That's what people naturally do. It should not be things that characterize God's people. We should not be known as complainers. We should be known as people who are grateful that we see the wonderful hand of God in many ways that he has taken care of us 
and provided for us, watched out for us, protected us. When people complain, God hears it and it makes him angry. Number three, there's another thing that we see in the Bible that makes uh, God angry. That is when people love and serve other things more than God. In a word, it's called idolatry in the Bible. The Jewish people were guilty of carving little statues out of wood or silver or gold and then bowing down to them. And we read in Deuteronomy 32, 21, it says, They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. And, you know, every time I think about people in the Old Testament back in those days, you know, carving idols and then bowing down to them, you know, here, here they are, carving these little totem poles and then worshiping them as if they had any power to help them. And, and it just goes to show us that the innate need to worship something larger than ourselves was put in us from God for God. And yet... Man has misdirected it toward other objects of affection instead of God. That's what idolatry is. But because man was created with this innate need to worship something, someone bigger than ourselves, when we don't worship God, we're bound to worship something else. We will worship something else if we don't worship God. And, and listen, it's not just an ancient practice that the Jews were guilty of. Or when we think about, well, you know, what tribal people worship you know, these inanimate objects, because there are places around the world, you know, but it, it's not just ancient practice of the Jews who were guilty of that or some tribal people who, who practice idolatry in some remote village of the Amazon. There's a modern version of this today, too, when we are more devoted to things and people and possessions than we are to God. That's idolatry. John Calvin once said that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. And that's why even in the New Testament, the apostle John affectionately calls us children. And he said in 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Number four on our list, something else that makes God angry is when people disobey the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In verse 24, he says, Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because, listen, they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Verse 25, therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. You know, it is true there when Isaiah talks about, woe to those who call evil good, good evil, put darkness for light, light for darkness, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I mean, our society is totally upside down now in its, in its morals and in its standards. Our, our culture is calling some things good that used to be called bad, and they're calling some things now bad that used to be good. It is totally inverted. It's totally upside down, and the church needs to be right side up, and it is the voice of believers that will continue to bring a clear call to what is right and to what is wrong in our world today based on the way that God sees it, based on His objective truth. And therefore, there needs to be a reverence for and an obedience to the Word of God. And if we don't do it, who will? The rest of the world isn't. So Christians have to be particular about a reverence for and an obedience to the Word of God. The Bible is not just a bunch of suggestions. It is the revelation of God to man that He came in flesh to redeem us from our sins by dying on a cross and that he invites us to have relationship with him through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. All, all relationships are based on two things. If it has any value whatsoever, whether we're talking about a marriage or we're talking about friendship, uh, every relationship is based on two things, love and loyalty. If you don't have those, you don't really have a relationship. 
God demonstrated his love and loyalty to us by dying on a cross and saving us from our sins. We demonstrate our love and loyalty to God by dying to ourselves and obeying his word. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, this is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. See, they're not burdensome when you begin to realize that God loves you so much, you want to obey him because you want to honor him. When you realize all that God has gone to, to what extent, for you and for me, then it motivates us to holy living. We want to obey his commands, not because they're burdensome, but because we want to honor him in response to what he has already done for us. Number five, the last one on our list before I get to the good news. This last one hits a little closer to home for me, I have to admit to you, but we see it in the Bible. Number five is what makes God angry when pastors fail to lead. And Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah said in chapter 10, verses two and three, he said, the idols speak deceit. Diviners see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. And therefore, the people wander like sheep oppressed for lack of a shepherd. Verse 3, God says, my anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord Almighty will care for his flock. And back in that day, God was calling out the shepherds, the pastors, the, the spiritual leaders of the people, because there was a time there in Israel's history when, when the pastors, when the, when the leaders were guilty of not telling the people what they needed to hear, and instead were telling people what they wanted to hear. And I suppose there have always been and always will be pastors like that, unfortunately. But I fear that we are repeating history these days. There are a number of pastors and spiritual leaders today who are not only reluctant to teach the Bible, but they are very open about their refusal to teach the Bible for fear that its message may offend. Can I just suggest to you that what is even more offensive is to deny people the opportunity to hear and believe the truth that will set them free? That's even more offensive, to deny people the opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that if they believe, would ultimately set them free. And Paul warned us that there would come a time when people would not put up with sound doctrine, but nevertheless, that should never discourage pastors from declaring the truth. And this is what Paul said to a young pastor by the name of Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2-5. He said to him, he exhorted him, and I take this to heart. Every every spiritual leader should take this to heart. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you... Timothy, you pastor, you spiritual leader, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Please, I invite you, pray for me and pray for our church and pray for pastors everywhere that we would be bold in declaring the word of God with grace and truth because anything less than that makes God angry. Well, I don't want to end this whole teaching on the thought that God is just in a bad mood, like God didn't have his cup of coffee in the morning, so he's just angry about a bunch of stuff. It's, it's not that at all. So a few closing things about God's anger to encourage you from Scripture that is important for us to understand. The good news about God's anger, three quick points. Number one, God is slow to anger and rich in mercy. This is Psalm 103, verses 8 to 11. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Isn't that good? It's not like, you know, God flies off the handle. You know, he he doesn't have a short fuse. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. 
He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Aren't you thankful for that? For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy or his love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. This is the heart of God. He's a merciful God, slow to anger, rich in mercy. Number two, it's important to also recognize that God's mercy, or rather God's anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. This is Psalm 30 verses four and five. It says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. It's the longevity of his favor compared to his anger. His anger is just for a moment. It is his favor that goes with us for a lifetime. Last one, number three. It's important to also note that God's anger toward us was satisfied by Christ's death on the cross. This is Romans 5, 8, and 9. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, by the blood of Jesus, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath, from God's anger through him? So as important as it is for us to understand, yes, there's this other side of God that gets angry. Rightfully so. Not all anger is sin. I don't want us to have this misperception about God that he's just this angry king on a throne, just ready to pounce on you, that he's constantly upset with you, because the Bible talks about his mercy being greater than his anger. It talks about how his favors for a lifetime, but his anger is just for a moment. It talks to us here in Romans 5 about how the anger of God, because of our sinful disobedience against him, has been appeased because of the sacrifice of Christ. And so God's mercy is great. And his favor is great. His forgiveness is great. His love for you is great. But we serve a holy God. And we need to recognize also that there are things that can make God angry. But thankfully, on an eternal scale, the wrath of God has been satisfied by the cross of Jesus Christ. So anytime you realize you have failed God, you've sinned against him, appeal to his mercy, ask for his forgiveness, and every time you will find his favor. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you. We recognize your word that we, we have to understand that there are things that make you angry. You are a righteous, holy, just God. And Father, we pray that we would recognize the things that grieve your heart, that cause you to be angry. And when we fail you, that we would be quick to run to you because your anger lasts for only a moment. But your mercy, your favor is for a lifetime. So thank you that we can always appeal to your mercy. We can always run to you as our Father because of what Christ has done for us. The wrath of God has been satisfied on the cross. And so thank you, Lord, that there's therefore now no condemnation to them that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That we can walk in newness of life, knowing, Lord, that you love us, that you forgive us, that your mercy is rich toward us. And we honor you, and we revere and respect you as a holy and just God. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen.